Mexico. It's 7.34 in a couple of seconds. You're watching and listening to Breakfast with Stephen and Alan. I'm trying to be as precise as I can. with 7.34 now. Oh, you go. <laughs> Just in case you've got anything planned that you exactly need to do at 7.34. Mm. We never know. Absolutely. Should we look through the papers? Here are the front pages. And the Sunday Times leads on the Prime Minister's advice to the King, apparently, telling him, requesting him, to stay away from the COP27 summit. And the Observer covers the flight of voters from the Conservative Party after the economic backlash to the mini-budget, well, according to the polls, anyway. Meanwhile, the Sunday Express reports that a man has now been charged relating to the case, the murder case, of nine-year-old Olivia pratt Corbell. Let's go through those papers in a bit more detail. Tom Slater is editor of Spiked Online. Nikki Hudson is an author and broadcaster, and they are both here. Good morning to you. Um, Tom, let's start with the Observer, should we? And a bit of this... Trussonomics, as we call it. Yes, so there's um, a lot of interest in what trussonomics is, where it comes from, um, and there's been many, many think pieces over the years of the connection between various kind of right of centre free market think tanks and the Tory party, particularly the Institute of Economic Affairs, um, who Liz Truss and a number of Tory MPs are, are particularly connected with. Um, I find the kind of ongoing obsession with this a little bit strange. Now, obviously, they have a lot of ideological uh, kinship and Liz Truss has spoken at more IEA events apparently than any other politician. But at the same time, if this was any other kind of think tank, I don't think anyone would really bat an eyelid. That there is this kind of slightly conspiratorial idea that these um, handful of relatively small think tanks kind of run Britain from behind the shadows, um, who are kind of pushing the shady interests of, of um, big business and all the rest of it. Whereas if you meet these people, as I have, and I agree with them on everything, I think actually a lot of the economics was never really going to survive contact with the electorate. But nevertheless, um, they're very committed people who sincerely believe these are the best ideas for the UK, like any other think tank would. Mm. So I think these sorts of pieces are constantly trying to sort of muckrake and uh, cast aspersions, really, on people who just have a different viewpoint. Really, oh, you get a lot of that, don't you? Yeah. <laughs> I think it's been, been really hyped up, though, since Dominic Cummings, on the idea that you could have a mastermind that's not the government mm. pulling strings. Mm. It, it seems to have more traction since then. It's very insulting, though, isn't it, that the fact that, I mean, by the look of it, Liz Trust knows her own mind, mm -hmm. but it's almost as though this sort of um, this sort of writing suggests that she's being influenced by others, oh, by exactly. dark forces. And whatever you say about Liz Trust, she obviously has a ideology, mm -hmm. which is a relatively rare thing these days yeah. in terms mm -hmm. of prime ministers, that there's this assumption that there's some kind of right-hand man or Svengali-like figure who's kind of filling in the blanks. Um, and she is a kind of conviction politician. I think in recent days, you know, it would have been good to see it have that conviction from actually from a lectern rather than behind closed doors just yeah. doubling down and not talking to anyone but um that's something that you've got to grapple with you can't just again sort of pretend that she's like the puppet of outside interests no yeah it's insulting isn't mm, it actually completely. yeah it is um migration nikki in the sun on sunday and um suella braverman yeah, so Suella Braverman has taken over where um, Priti Patel left off. And she's basically saying that, well, she's vowing to deal with channel migrants. Really important point about this article, um, the Sun repeatedly refers to the people coming across the channel as illegal. They're not, by international law definition. Oh, You're not illegal if you arrive. If you don't have the right paperwork and you come in and you enter, then you can potentially be illegal. So it's a really important distinction. I know it's subtle, but it's it's kind of the, the whole article is because I don't get that. Well, so if you arrive somewhere, like you literally come up on port somewhere, that isn't breaking the law. You're allowed to do that the whole world over to appear at a port. It's then if you enter the country, like maybe it's forged paperwork or without paperwork, ah. that's the distinction. So there's no such thing as an illegal channel migrant, as in like being in the channel, being in the boat isn't illegal. No, but if they, if they, if they land on our shores and they just and what, just wander off into Kent somewhere. Yes, but that's the distinction. So, so it's important to say that you are allowed to try and seek a better life somewhere else. That isn't illegal in and of itself. So I, I, just, I just think it's important to say because we don't really think about it like that. Mm. We think that everybody trying to come to, from another country is doing it illegally, you know, unless they're a different kind but of immigrant. They, but if they're coming across in small boats across the channel, and they might technically not be illegal immigrants until they land the boat, but they're trying to be illegal. So we've got a right to stop them in the waters, haven't we, if well, they are trying to be an illegal immigrant. But they're not necessarily trying, that's the thing. Some of them just don't have the right paperwork, or some of them are coming to claim, um, you know, that they're threatened back home, or, refugees, you know, they're, they're refugees, yeah. they're refugee status. So it's just an important distinction, and we don't really make it that often. But to come back to what Suella Braverman is saying, she says that the Modern Slavery Act, which Trees May updated, is causing us lots of problems and that everybody is using it as um, 
you know, the kind of reason why they should be allowed to stay. The Modern Slavery Act distinguishes between being a slave here in the UK and other countries, and the number of people saying that they're, they're a slave in Britain has gone up. But she's saying that actually people live here for sometimes two, three years and like, look like they're having a great time, uh, you know, a good life, basically, and she thinks those claims are sp spurious. Mm. So, yeah, is she, and is she saying there that she's going to clamp down on illegal immigration? Is there any substance to what she's saying there, or is it just a headline? Well, at the minute... It's because just, we've heard it from every... Well, exactly. Before. At the minute, it's just a headline. The numbers of people attempting to come are going up, so that's what she's trying to mm. address, and The Sun is very kind of pro her doing this. But I think, you know, again, and also, just to kind of put it into context, about the Modern Slavery Act, so people using that as a reason for why they should be allowed to stay. In 2009, there were 500, 552 people saying it. And in 2021, that had gone up to 12,727. Wow. So you can see that they, the, the feeling from Suella Braverman is that there are people that are putting in spurious claims, like this isn't working. It's and the problem is it costs money to even investigate those claims. Yes, of course, of course. Mm. So obviously there'll be lots of people who are saying, no, the Modern Slavery Act is a really important act of human rights, it's there to protect people. Actually, lots of people are, are in, involved in slavery or are enslaved. But, you know, it, it, again, it's one of those things where she's picking up the mantle from Priti Patel. She's, like, very, very determined this is the right way to go with the voters. Uh, but she'll have to deliver on it. But it is about securing the borders, isn't it, and letting people in who who we want them. In terms of migration, let, it was about taking back control, wasn't it? That was the mantra. So it's about... That's from, from the Tory yeah, party, yes. Yeah, so about, yeah. so about taking, taking back control of who we allow in as migrants, whether it's more or less than we currently have. But all, uh, and refugees and asylum seekers, but stopping everybody else. Yeah, but I mean, the point, of, you know, from the Tory party, as it's become increasingly hard line about this kind of immigration, is that we just kind of, we don't seem to have a lot of sympathy with people that are fleeing situations that are terrible. Mm. I, think, I think it's difficult, though, because it becomes a bit of a insult to voters' intelligence when, for instance, all these people are presented as refugees when it's quite clear that a good chunk of them are sure. migrants. I think even people, I'm very pro-migration, we shouldn't kind of rely on those kinds of conflations just to kind of pull up the heartstrings. If you want to have an argument about wanting more immigration or even a more genuine or more generous, I should say, asylum policy, you can't do that in a kind of underhand way or rely on lawyers to kind of fight these cases on asylum grounds or on um, modern slavery grounds or whatever. Wow. It's, like, it's like just bypassing the electorate, and I think that's one of the things that's really inflamed this particular issue. And actually what's interesting is that, particularly on the question of legal migration, it's become very liberal since Brexit, and actually voters' attitudes softened towards immigration in large part in the years after Brexit because they felt like it was getting a grip on. You've got more of an opening there to say, mm -hmm. what kind of immigration do we want? And you can have out that argument. But the more this issue of, of the boats in particular continues to kind of rumble on, the more you're going to see anti-immigration sentiment rise up because people won't feel like it's being dealt with. Yeah. And, and, and like they know, consult. and we're, we're getting this even this morning, from you, that people know that it's costing the country a fortune mm. to deal with every single case legally with the very expensive lawyers and, and detainment centres and all the rest of it. Yeah. It's costing a fortune. Well, people just don't feel that anyone's on top of it. Yeah. And also, you know, they don't feel that we work well enough with fans. That's one of the other issues. You know, there isn't enough co-working there. It's um, so because whenever they try to get on top of it, then everyone jumps on board and starts mm, being mm. cruel and nasty. Yeah. It's very difficult, and you can't get rid of the optics because it's something you can see happening. Yeah, yeah. OK, let's have a look at the sun on Sunday, and no time to die yet. Yeah. Um, looking at spies, <laughs> Tom. Por porky spies. Yeah, the, the spies are getting a bit fat, apparently. Um, so, um, Britain's Secret Service, they've recruited a health guru to try and keep an eye on the waistlines of um, the nation's spooks. Uh, apparently, because because one of the reasons it's cited here is the fact that the canteen at MI5 is apparently very rich and well-stocked. Um, so you could steak and pie, chip and chips, treacle, sponge and custard often served in their subsidised canteen. And as a result of that, some of them are getting a little bit porky. This also being the sun on Sunday, of course, they've um, taken the opportunity to do a list of Tubby Bond films, like Dr. No Carbs, Donna <laughs> Majesty's Secret Service, and so on and so forth. So, uh, a silly story, but, you know... So it's basically they're, they're saying yeah. it's MI5 headquarters. Mm -hmm are just serving the wrong sorts of meals and it sounds, our spy is fat. But you yeah. don't want just... You can't have every spy like James Bond. No. Who are the best infiltrators? Think of people like George Smiley. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah. old, mm -hmm. chubby, <laughs> you know, non You'd never think spy, would you? No. no. So much of the work is... It's brain work, so does it really matter if you're a bit overweight? Yeah. I don't know, we were talking about... Is there a lot of desk brain job brain? aspects? Yeah. I imagine these oh, days are all very cyber. Yeah. Yeah. Not, but, uh, yeah. I think better after a pudding, definitely. definitely. You know, some, some dashing <laughs> or gorgeous person 
you know, strutting along, mm. maybe would get you, you know, are going to draw attention yeah, to themselves. Yeah. But, you know, some... Maybe we need porky spies. <laughs> should be old man in a dirty Mac walking about. Oh, charming. No one's going to notice, <laughs> I mean, that's how it works. That's how it works. I say more pudding. <laughs> People get more pudding there at MI5. Nikki, in The Observer, you found a story about patients being told to stay away from A&E. Oh, gosh, this is very depressing, but I feel like it's, oh. it's a public service to announce it. If you're thinking about going to A&E, um, please note that actually eight hospitals in the UK have declared a critical incident um, because of COVID numbers increasing. And so basically they're saying don't come to A&E unless it absolutely is a life or death situation. And that's just kind of like the beginning of it. Apparently we are at the very start of the autumn wave of COVID. Mm. So okay. if, unless you really do need urgent med medical attention, try and seek help elsewhere. Are they using, are they using COVID as an excuse? Because too, too many people go to A&E when they shouldn't. They do anyway, don't they? But um, some are going because they can't get to see yeah, their GP. No, yes, yeah, that's the yeah, problem. Yeah. So many little incidents, or, you know, so-called minor issues are ending up in A&E because they mm. just can't get a doctor's appointment. Oh, it's just very depressing. Well, you can go to one of those lovely walk-in centres. I've used my local walk-in centre. But it's like any, you still have to queue for hours. Yeah. Really? Hours and hours. I, know, I always think the problem with these warnings as well is that the hypochondriacs, the people who want to show up at A&E because they've stubbed their toe or whatever, they're not going to be, they're going to be impervious to this kind of message. Absolutely. They always are. Yeah. It's the people who probably should go who are going to hear that and think, no, I shouldn't trouble them and all the rest of it. But it's also people yeah. like, what if you've got a baby and you don't know what to do with your baby? You know, it's like, just because you don't know what's going on. It's those kinds of issues. Or yeah. someone that feels really unwell is turned away and then later on they've been diagnosed with stage four cancer or something. We've heard so many of those yeah, stories come out. Yeah. story yesterday, yeah. wasn't there, about that young man who couldn't get an appointment and then ended up dying. Yeah. 26 year old. Oh, awful, so, so awful so story. So depressing. Awful story. But don't you think some A&Es aren't run well and some are? Yes, very much. It's a, it's a postcode lottery it, which A&E goes to in many ways. Yes. Logistics. But, yes, exactly. Some There are clearly some A&E managers who can manage an A&E ward really well. Um, and they get through people, and it works. Mm. And others, where you just, you, you know, you'd never even try, really. No. It's hours waiting. Yeah. And you wonder what makes the difference. Yeah. Good management. Yeah. yeah. Good, de decent logistics. But we said that last time I went to a and I'd, I'd cut my finger, and I thought it would, it didn't need stitching in the end. But you ended up going, because you think, I think this might need to... I did it in one of those, you know, those slicer things. Ah, yes. Uh, uh, uh. Yeah. It's really nasty. Ooh, it's really nasty. I sat there for about five hours, and then they, I mean, they dressed it and everything, but didn't stitch it. Mm -hmm. So you, you end up leaving thinking, oh, I've just what wasted was everyone's time yes. there. Yeah, yeah. and but, my own. Yeah. But I was worried. Yeah. It was, it was a lot of problems. That's what an A&E is meant to be for. Yeah, we it? all need to cheer ourselves up <laughs> in a quality street. <laughs> well, this is quite controversial. I don't know if it's going to cheer people up or not. So apparently, Quality Street, so you're getting excited to have you bought your big boxes from a supermarket yet. They're probably in stock in the next couple of weeks, aren't they, for Christmas? Yes, yes. I've started Christmas shopping, just because that's who I am. Anyway, um, they apparently are changing the plastic, shiny, crinkly wrappers mm. for wax paper ones. Well, good. <laughs> well, good for the environment, but they're worried that people are not going to get the satisfaction of the noise and the, uh, the, the sensations when you open it. I think we're a bit more across single use use plastics now. Yes, I think so too. Every, it is a huge amount of wasted plastic, isn't it, in a box? Every, the, and I remember last Christmas just thinking, there's all this plastic here, mm -hmm. it's just going straight in. What a waste. What a waste. Yeah. So let's just be a bit more sensible with it. But the thing they are changing is the amount of toffee pennies in a box, oh, which that. is always very controversial in our household. The only thing is, if it's wax wrappers, then how are you going to tell which is which? They're coloured. They're, they're still coloured. They're still coloured. They're still coloured. Because I like the purple ones. Oh, I like the purple ones. I, like the purple ones. I think everyone likes the purple ones. Yeah. I like the purple I don't ones. Think, <laughs> you can actually buy quality street that's just purple ones, can you? Yeah. Sometimes they do. It's about I like feel the, as rewarding, wouldn't no, it? No, I like the green triangle. Yeah, green I'm part triangle. of the green triangle. And I like the, um, I like the blue ones, the coconut ones. Oh, I like yeah, yeah, the yes, those are nice. Stephen, we must never... Not any of them. Yeah. Just, give me, give me. <laughs> <laughs> like all them. We like the same ones, so we must never... No, that's the problem. A box. Yes, exactly. But if, find someone who likes the... Yeah, you've got to have a family where they, everybody likes something different. Yeah. The toffee pennies are all right if you just try and suck them. Yes. Though it's very hard. You're otherwise, they, otherwise they pull the fillings out of your teeth, <laughs> don't they? They do. Oh, nice, though. Mmm, lovely. Well, you've whet my appetite with that this morning. Thank you very much indeed. Um, we'll see you two a little bit later on, though. Unless there's something...